And what was really exciting and what I think has led to the share price rising and the growth of the company was the growth that we've had at the Wolf deposit. And now we're talking about Moose. So, you know, the best way for me to describe it, Carrie, is these are like a string of pearls, right? And we think each of these pearls has the potential to be like our Torbrit mine, which was a 50 million ounce silver deposit. Now, there is also another result in there from Chance, which is in the pearl. And uh, it was, a, let's call it a 200 gram hit over 23 meters, 200 gram per ton silver over 23 meters. Um, so, you know, I think we've got at least five, if not six, maybe seven of these that have the potential to be 50 million ounce silver deposits. The Financial Survival Network. Now more than ever. The Financial Survival Network. And welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. You are watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, your host. Hey, we've got an exciting update from from our good friends over at Dolly Varden Silver. Uh, CEO Sean Kuhn Kuhn is with us now. And Sean, I just uh, picked up on the latest drill results, which were pretty extraordinary. Uh, 978 uh, grams per ton silver over five meters and uh, 3670 over 0.79 meters at the uh, moose lamb vein which i hadn't heard of before uh pretty exciting no very exciting carry and, and just to sort of take a step back from the moose uh hit um you know this is a project that has a significant silver inventory. You know, we've got close to 150 million ounces of silver equivalent in all categories. And what we're trying to demonstrate with the drilling program um, is that there is a significant room for expansion. So the Dolly Varden silver mine, which was the richest silver mine in the British Empire, and then you move up a, about a kilometer and a half and you've got the Torbert deposit, which was Canada's third largest silver mine. And what was really exciting and what I think has led to the share price rising and the growth of the company was the growth that we've had at the Wolf deposit. And now we're talking about moose. So, you know, the best way for me to describe it, Carrie, is these are like a string of pearls right? And we think each of these pearls has the potential to be like our Torbrit mine, which was a 50 million ounce silver deposit. Now, there is also another result in there from Chance, which is in the pearl. And uh, it was, a, let's call it a 200 gram hit over 23 meters, 200 gram per ton silver over 23 meters. Um, so, you know, I think we've got at least five, if not six, maybe seven of these that have the potential to be 50 million ounce silver deposits. And you start doing the math on that. And then you factor in the million ounces of gold up at home stake that not to mention also is accompanied by 20 million ounces of silver. And we're, we're, we've drilled the target called Red Point which could be the next big gold discovery. So what I'm really trying to showcase here is we've got a project that's in its infancy and the proof in the pudding is all of this exciting discovery and expansion and extension news. Drilling, uh, what's taking place right now to uh, extend these uh, finds? So we've got three rigs that are currently turning 24 hours a day. We've completed 25 drill holes. We've announced two. Um, we have a total of 25,000 meters of drilling. And, you know, we might have completed, you know, just under a third of that so far. And that's the plan meters. You know, we could always make a decision to significantly expand the drill program. Last year, we drilled over 50,000 meters. So we have the budget and the capability technically uh, and logistically and with manpower and equipment to do so. Um, so, you know, and really like this is a company and I, I really think that, you know, I will say this, like the stock market's all about growth, 
you know, whether you're uh, your NVIDIA or your Tesla or your uh, Apple or Nike or your Dolly Varden Silver. And our growth comes from growing silver discoveries. And, you know, four years ago, this was a 20 something cent stock. Uh, it's now trading north of a dollar a share. And that was at a time where there hasn't been a tremendous amount of interest for small micro cap precious metals equities. We're starting to see a little bit of interest. And um, I just think that, you know, we are we are very, very well positioned for this coming bull market. Hey, and during the time you mentioned the four year period where the interest has been, uh, you know, weak at best to uh, really Dolly Varden, a couple of other companies have really stood out during that time where you've been able to raise the capital. You haven't put have to do things on care and maintenance and deferrals. You don't have to defer your drilling programs. So that uh, kind of makes you uniquely situated because obviously we're in a new precious metals bull market cycle. And where do you think we are in this cycle here, Sean? Um, I think this is a baby bull. I think it's it's early early days. It's a baby bull. Um, uh, I've got a friend. Um, he's also an, an investment advisor. Um, his name's Bob Thompson. Yeah, Bob is over at Raymond James, and Bob has famously coined uh, the the idea or the term the mining clock. Um, and and essentially, you know, one o'clock being the start, and and you know, eleven o'clock being close to the end of the party. And where Bob thinks we are is, you know, he thinks we're somewhere in that six to seven o'clock range. But he also talks about how you know ninety percent of the wealth is created after nine p.m. Right. So um, it's in those final, particularly for the microcaps. Um, so I, I agree with you. We are in a bull market. I agree with uh, Bob about you know it's you know we're we're moving towards that moment. Uh, it could be a few years uh, f- from now, um, or you know could be measured in you know eighteen months. Um, but one thing I do know is if you look at where the price of silver is relative to gold, this is an indication that we haven't seen the end of it. You know, gold's putting in new all-time highs. Silver is only trading at 60% of its all-time high. And so that's a great indicator that it's still early days. The other phenomenal indicator is where mining equities are relative to other asset classes. Now, we could take the, um, whether we take the price of gold or gold equities to Dow ratio, or we take something like where the venture exchange is trading as an index. So, you know, the Canadian venture exchange is a great proxy to junior mining companies. And the fact that we're trading lower today than we were trading in the low of the great financial crisis is telling me that, you know, the bull market may have begun, but it's begun for the metal, the bullion, you know, the coins, you know, um, it's begun for some of the large caps, you could argue, like companies like Agnico Eagle or Newmont or Barrick, um, Kinross, but really for developers, small producers, uh, for, forget exploration companies, uh, it's early days. Hey, well, my personal feeling, and I don't, I'm not an expert like you were, Bob, but I think this party could extend on and it could be a uh, mammoth party that goes on till six in the morning. Uh, till all the people go home. <laughs> That's my personal opinion. I think uh, the clock's going to be running longer on this cycle than any others because of the economic issues. But time, uh, time will certainly prove that out. And also, I agree with Bob because the M and A activity hasn't really hit stride yet. That's what we've all kind of been waiting for, isn't it? You you make two incredible points there. Um, I'm going to touch on the first one. Bob was measuring that mining ca- clock analogy, and he was doing it in a currency that was the world's reserve currency, where you had confidence in those dollars, where you know he was looking at the last 50, 60, 70 years. But you are absolutely right. The reason this could be an all-night rager um, is the fact that if 
we and you look at like you know the petrodollar you know the renewal not happening out of saudi you look at like what the bricks are doing you look at you know gold being a tier one asset you look at all these things that have been unfolding now for decades like this has been building for decades the debt levels all this insanity the wars uh the spending and you're right. Like this, this is this could be a you know, like you know, you start measuring gold in in uh, the Weimar Republic or in other scenarios, um, Zimbabwe. You know, if you you get into a place where the confidence goes in those greenbacks, um, it's you know, this is going to be a very very different scenario. And as far as M and A goes, this is very interesting. And I feel like I'm on the front lines of this. So. I've been running Dolly Varn for four years. I've been working with a great team. We've got a great asset. And, you know, like you said, it's been one of the few, gratefully, we're one of the few companies that have had some positive momentum. Now, despite that positive momentum, and apart from one corporate at Hecla, it's been very quiet in the land of corporates and competitive tension and MA activity. Jerry, in the last two months, there's been a flurry of inbounds that we've been fielding from silver companies, from gold companies that all of a sudden want to have conversations. But what's interesting about that is I really think that that M&A stuff hasn't even started. So for example, if I'm a silver producer, I might want to look at other producers I can merge with, but those silver, very, very few producers are looking into that developer category, looking for that uh, pipeline project to develop. They want to grow production. So that tells me, like, once we start going out to the producers buying the Explore Coast, like, they're not even ready for the developers yet. Right. And so they just want to merge up with peers at this point. And that tells me that it's early, 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 early days. And the great news is, and again, this is measuring, you know, the last 50, 60, 70 years. Um, and so these numbers, we might need to move the decimal point one to the right here from what I'm about to say. But the value of a silver ounce in the ground has ranged between. 40 cents to $4. There's some exceptions based on quality of ounces, but that's the range. You go back to August of 2020 when silver went to $30 uh, from a $12 low, $4 an ounce, right? You go to the depths of you know, 2014, 15 bear market, you know, companies are trading for like 50 cents an ounce in the ground. My point in all this is the longer it takes the corporates to build up that M and A momentum, we'll be trading at that. Right now, we're we're somewhere in the middle. You know, the average company is probably trading around the between one and two dollars. So it's not forty cents. It's not four dollars. It's between one and two dollars in the ground value for silver. And a lot of things determine whether you're a dollar or two dollars size, grade, location. But my point here is. What $4 could buy you 20 years ago, it can no longer buy you. So we might be in an environment where that in situ value, that enterprise value per ounce needs to be $5, $6. You know, you know if we're printing uh, a trillion new dollars every 100 days, you know, how many of those dollars is it going to take to go after an ounce of silver? Good question. Good question. And in addition, the uh, producers have got their own issues with dwindling reserves, and they haven't really addressed that for, for quite a while, other than looking for peer-to-peer -peer mergers. 100%. And, um, you know, what's crazy is if you look at production, you know, the you know so from those reserves they're producing, and you look at the production profile of the big ones, like the new mods, the barracks, the Ignicos, most of their production is lower today than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and that's after printing hundreds of millions of shares through dilutive acquisitions just to try to maintain 
80% of previous production, 70% of previous production. So, you know, we're we're in a universe right now where and and that's not a great place to be for for an investor. If you're an investor and you know, gold stocks are going to outperform gold or or silver stocks are going to outperform silver. Well, if you're if you're in a major that's got dwindling resources and the only way for them to replenish those resources is to make expensive acquisitions. Well, the companies to focus on are the emerging producers, you know, the junior producers and the companies that can build resources through discovery. So it's the Explorcos. It's really that that's where the value is created in the mining sector. But when you're in a bear market, the place to hide out is in the royalty companies and in the senior producers. But now that we're moving into that baby bull market, it's time for investors. And I, the sweet spot that I've tried to pick after doing this for 20 years and, and studying it and focusing on it um, is find a company that's got a deposit that has the ability to grow that deposit. And that, I think, is the real sweet spot. Um, so that's where we're, we try to focus. And Dolly Varden fits that profile um, to the T. All right. Hey, any events coming up that you see uh, could have a material impact on the sector and on Dolly Varden uh, in the near future? Well, oh, it's like a powder keg. You know, there's 99 things that are ready to have this whole thing explode. And uh, so, had you wanted alphabetically, Jerry? Well, let's just say the top three from your perspective. Well, listen, I think um, it's hard to put your finger on the calendar where confidence goes. But you look at, like, you look, I remember when I first started. The narrative 20 years ago, the narrative was, you know, what if China trades treasuries or dollars for other things? And over the course of the last decade, we've seen, you know, them move half of their dollars or their US denominated bonds into agricultural land, commodities, real estate. They've taken dollars and they turned them into hard assets. So um, if Japan, who's now the single largest holder of dollar denominated debt um, for as a foreigner, just makes the same move that China does, I think that could be the major catalyst to send uh, commodities priced in dollars through the roof, including silver and gold. Um, so that's number one. I think the other thing that could impact our markets is uh, a recession, a depression. You know, and and initially, you know, during those types of events, you know, gold and silver in nominal terms could get impacted negatively for a minute. But what history has taught us is um, they will be the best performing assets and the place to actually, from a relative basis, to preserve wealth. So I think uh, you know more central banks moving away from dollars, sort of de-dollarization. Um, you've got the, uh, the potential for slower growth or recession. And, uh, and then, you know, uh, Jim Rickards uh, talks about um, currency wars, trade wars, and then real wars. And you know the the world has gone from cold to hot on the war front. So that's that's another risk. Um, but ultimately, there are things that are happening, like growing industrial demand or growing demand out of Asia for these metals that even without these three factors, I think are very significant. Like for example. In Q1, the buying that's come out of India for silver has been material. Like if you took India and solar, that makes up, you know, a third of all demand for silver today. Substantial, substantial. So, so a lot of potential uh, pluses down the road. And uh, even if things just stay the same, even though they appear to be pretty unsustainable, but even if they stay the same, the demand. Uh, aspects are going up for gold and silver. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. All 
All right. Well, we got some things to chew over here. Really interesting news, and uh, the results couldn't be better. And we just got a small percentage of them. Um, in your humble opinion, anything uh, approaching what Moose Lamb is? Uh, any targets there that you think are going to be equal or even better? We've got all three rigs turning on the Wolf deposit, and I'm really interested and excited about uh, we're, we're employing a method, Kerry, called directional drilling. And this directional drilling, it's a little bit more expensive than your traditional drilling method. But the reason we're using it this year is if you think about some of our targets, you know, you're going from surface and you're going down, you know, hundreds and hundreds of feet below the surface. So if we, you know, based on all of our, you know, scientific um tools like the the geophysics, the geochemistry, understanding the geology. If we take all that information and we look at where we know the mineralization is, and if we try to target and pinpoint where we think we could have an extension, you could have the drill bit deviate from surface to target depth. What the directional drilling does is it makes you it improves your precision. And why I'm excited about that is there are multiple structures that have brought in the high-grade silver mineralization. I think this directional drain is going to capture more than one structure, which should lead to capturing more silver over a greater thickness, which would result in better results. So I'm real that we've never done it in the hundred year history of the Dolly Vard project. Directional drilling has never been employed, and this is the this is tapping right now, and results are pending. All right, so this could be the game changer uh, in the whole uh, exploration uh, sector here. Directional drilling, like horizontal drilling, was for uh, petroleum and uh, not gas. So, all right, well, we're going to look forward to those results. Uh, ask everybody who's uh, watching, listening, uh, go over to dollyvardensilver.com. Sign up for notifications, ticker symbols in the U.S., D-O-L-L-F, and, of course, in Canada, D-V. Sean, we'll be talking to you again soon. We'll see you at the uh, Rick Rule Symposium in Boca Raton. That is from uh, July 7th to the 11th. So if any of you are in the neighborhood, please stop by, and uh, we'll talk to you then. Thanks so much, Kerry. Looking forward to seeing you soon. The Financial Survival Network.